Platelet-rich plasma is basically where we take your blood, we concentrate it using a centrifuge, and that just spins it at a really high volume. And what that does is concentrates the platelets, and hence the name platelet-rich plasma, because it's rich in platelets. And platelets, you can think of them like little molecules, and they're kind of the drug that we're injecting into the body to help it to heal. Platelets have something called growth factors and something called cytokines. Now, the cytokine profile is the key to how, what determines if PRP is going to be efficacious. We and, have to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, that's, and that's the biggest issue with this whole PRP field is there's no standardization when it comes to PRP. You have a thousand clinics offering PRP now, and no one's doing it. No one's m majority of them are, a are not measuring cytokines, and b majority of them don't even know what they're doing when they're injecting the stuff or what they're injecting. Thank you to Vivo Health for sponsoring this episode of the show. Vivo Health makes the most incredible footwear, and that is Vivo Barefoot. I use these shoes to train, to walk around in. You better believe that they are incredible. Here's why I love Vivo Barefoot. Number one, it allows me to feel very stable in all of my training. I feel like I can move without being afraid that I'm going to trip. I feel as if my feet are getting stronger. And in fact, there is evidence to support that my feet are getting stronger. Studies show that foot strength increases by roughly 60% in just a matter of months by walking around in these shoes. It's kind of like exercise for your feet. Another thing is this footwear is made from recycled materials. And I can't help but think about all of the waste that we put uh, especially, you know, with my little kids, we're always going through clothes and, and shoes. This footwear uses recycled materials with the aim to protect the planet. If you don't like the shoes, all you have to do is let them know. But I know that that's not going to happen. VivoBarefoot.com. That's VivoBarefoot.com slash Dr. Lion for 15% off. Dr. Adil Khan, thank you so much for joining me today. I am very excited to bring this conversation forward and we're going to learn a whole bunch. Yeah, I know. I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to this for a while. <laughs> you know, it's really funny. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier to you, there's not uh, there's probably been only a handful of times where people have said to me, you really you got to sit down with Dr. Khan. You've got to talk to him. And a special shout out to the Mind Pump guys and to <laughs> Jordan Shallows. But really, uh, and you have treated and we know and have many, many mutual friends. So I'm really grateful that you're here. I'm grateful for the opportunity, and I think it's going to be a really exciting conversation. Yeah. And, you know, just on that note, I was looking at some of the data regarding joints, and I'm just going to share this with you. So basically, you guys, what we're going to be talking all about is not just musculoskeletal health, musculoskeletal health, probably cartilage, tendons, anything that would impair a body's ability to function from a physical aspect. Would you say that that's right on point? Exactly. Yep. And just check out these numbers. These are annual numbers, 800,000 knee replacements a year, mm -hmm. 450,000 hip replacements, and 150,000 shoulder replacements annually. Those, and, and let me just keep going, 21% um, of the entire population has arthritis. And 51% in the U.S., 51% of adults in the U.S. have arthritis. That's over half the population yeah. of adults. That's insane. And what you do, in part, is to make that better. Yes, and we're doing it quite successfully. <laughs> and I think it's important to remember joint replacements aren't 100% success either. And so that's why people are looking for better alternatives. But not only that, there's a lot of people who are being offered these at a very young age when these joint replacements won't last the whole duration of their actual metallic longevity, essentially. Absolutely. And I, I've, I've seen that. And the Things that we as physicians, so you are a physician, and I do want to hear about your history and how you got into regenerative medicine, the options that we can offer patients for things like arthritis, for things like uh, labral tears, the traditional medicine is not good. No, it's really not. <laughs> what, what do we have? So if someone comes to you and says, I have an arthritic knee, 
Yeah. The standard of care is what? Yeah, exactly. And this is what got me. I mean, this is exactly why I got into it is because these patients would come to me as a sports doctor and then interventional pain kind of train. We're treating chronic pain, which is half of it is osteoarthritis. It's not more than half. And so people come in with a knee issue and they've tried physio, they've tried acupuncture, they've tried the conservative management, maybe bracing. And now they're going to a doctor because they're trying to see what's next because I've tried all the conservative routes. And the doctor, generally speaking, will do something called cortisone injections. That's kind of the first line and still... I I think most guidelines still recommend that as a first guide as a first line and unfortunately cortisone is great temporarily as a pain relief because it reduces inflammation but then what is it doing to the joint and we know there's enough data not just in vitro data suggesting that there's chondrotoxicity which means cortisone is actually toxic to the cartilage meaning it eats away at it and that's in vitro meaning test tube studies but then there's in vivo data an actual clinical trial data showing that even one injection can accelerate the progression of osteoarthritis. And this is something that is never done in terms of proper consent, meaning the physician never informs the patient to say that, hey, we're going to do this cortisone, but it may make, th it may make things worse in the long term. I've never had a single patient who's been told by an orthopedic surgeon that this is a possibility. I, If I do cortisone, which I rarely do, but if I'm doing it, for example, if a patient's going on vacation and they just want some pain relief and they really want something to reduce inflammation, then I'll tell them, hey, we can do this, but this is what is a possibility. And that's called proper informed consent, which is unfortunately not happening. And so it's such a disservice because then these patients get the cortisone, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And then even if it does work, it eventually stops working. And then what's next? Then usually the orthopedic surgeon will say, okay, we can do maybe hyaluronic acid that's becoming more and more common, which is just a lubricant basically to replenish the joint, kind of like an oil change for your joint. And that'll last six months typically, and then eventually that'll stop working. And then they'll say, okay, now you're ready for joint replacement. And it's almost, it's almost ironic because it's like the system is feeding itself because when you do cortisone, they also mix in something called marcaine or bupivacaine. Yeah. And marcaine and bupivacaine are also chondrotoxic. So you're basically putting in a bunch of chondrotoxic fluid into the joint that is then setting them up for knee replacement even faster. And that's unfortunate. That really is unfortunate. Before we dive into all the details, tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you get to be doing what you are doing? It takes a very special type of person to think outside the box. And usually there's a moment where you go, you know what, what I'm doing right now, there has to be a better option. So take us through a little bit about your history, your background, what kind of physician you are, how you were trained. Yeah, well, I think like many, many people who are a bit outside of the box thinkers, I started off as a fitness trainer. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I didn't. But, oh, really? Okay. But I, I thought, maybe I should have. Yeah, I'm surprised you did it. Because uh, yeah, so I worked at, uh, I worked at a, at a gym, just like a personal trainer. And when you when you work as a personal trainer, though, you obviously see how exercise can be medicine, right? You see it firsthand. You see patients with diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues all get better when they just start eating better and they start exercising and give the right dosing, so to speak, with that stuff. So Obviously, I saw it as a personal trainer before I went into medicine. And then when I'm in medical school, I was all excited because I'm like, oh, I'm really going to get to treat people and reverse disease and I all this. I think we all we all feel that way going to medical school. <laughs> yeah. So you're so, ex you know, you're so enthusiastic. And then it's there's I had one lecture on nutrition. And where you, you went to medical school. So you're Canadian. Yeah. University of Ottawa, which in in in. in Canada, all the schools are considered pretty top tier because there's not that many medical schools. Uh, so you get a good education, but even top tier is essentially just very lip service when it comes to nutrition and lifestyle medicine. So the one lecture we had on nutrition was the Canada's food guide. And I remember arguing with the person being like, this isn't right. Like there, there's more to this. And then, then the nutritionist who was teaching us was like, no, this is what the endocrinologists teach us. This is what the American Diabetic Association says. This is what American Heart Association says. This is what we have to follow. And I was kind of just like, this is crazy. <laughs> so that was my first like kind of moment being like, okay, there's obviously something going on here. This is just this is just odd. Why aren't we learning more about the root cause of disease when we know there are interventions that can help to reverse it? And so that's what kind of led me during medical school Yes, I was studying allopathic medicine, which is medical, like a doctorate in medicine. But then I was also studying functional and integrative medicine. So I was just kind of, that's what I used to read for fun, basically. And I don't, I, first of all, I don't know how you had any time to read <laughs> anything else in medical school, because that is brutal in itself. When you finished medical school, did you do um, 
what kind of residency did you do? I just did general practice, but then I did- Is that family medicine? Yes, exactly. But then I went into sports medicine, which is kind of its own two-year yes. fellowship training. And I worked under Dr. Anthony Gallia, who's kind of the pioneer of something called platelet-rich plasma injections. I have a question. Is it was he is he Italian? He is. He Malta. is Italian. Malta, yeah. Okay. Malta. I think so that gentleman has quite a reputation. He has he sees a lot of athletes mm -hmm. that are um I believe um, under the radar, not saying under the radar, maybe a better way of saying is there's a lot of individuals that go to him that maybe don't publicize that Yeah, for, for sure. injuries, for um, injury prevention, et cetera. Yeah. And, and that's still the case for myself and him because unfortunately, most team doctors are orthopedic surgeons. Not saying that's a bad, they're mm -hmm. amazing surgeons. They're great if you need your body open and you need surgery, but many of these people do not need surgery and there's alternatives. And so they have to sneak behind the doors more or less and come see us and not tell their team. And did you, when you did a fellowship in them, is it a standard fellowship? It is, is it, for example, here in the US, if you do a sports medicine fellowship, it may be one or two years and it is within a governing body. Is that the same for you or was this more of a, a mentorship? Fellowship? Yeah, it was more like a mentorship. They have like the formal one as well, but mm -hmm. I didn't want to do the formal one. I chose not to because that's a one year formal fellowship and then you get like that whole uh, kind of like traditional, I guess, designation. But I chose to mentor under him and do two years instead of one year because I wanted to learn learn innovative medicine, whereas I looked at the traditional curriculum and it was literally so boring because it was it was essentially just very, there was no intervention. It was basically physio, cortisone, and and then referrals to surgery. That, that's what primary care sports medicine was. And I was just kind of like, this isn't exciting. Like, how is this? How? And I didn't feel like I was doing anything for patients. I was just refer, I was either getting them NSAIDs, referring to physio, cortisone, and then surgery. That's it. And then you started, so you, you finished this fellowship and during this fellowship, you learned, I'm assuming, um, PRP, um, stem cell. I don't, I don't think they call it stem cell anymore. Fat transfer or, a t yeah. So basically. And by the way, I've had all of these done. Oh, okay. I, I would love to hear <laughs> your perspective on a very significant injury that I've had. Um, so yes, the, yeah. I'd love to hear the kinds of interventions that you've been doing, that you have done. Yeah. So, so the biggest issue with PRP and, and people don't even know what PRP is. Yeah, exactly. If so, you were to outline your, how many different treats, treatments did you guys do? Three, five? Yeah, I would say like four to five okay. really mainstay treatments. And, and what are those? So platelet-rich plasma is basically where we take your blood, we concentrate it using a centrifuge, and that just spins it at a really high volume. And what that does is concentrates the platelets, and hence the name platelet-rich plasma, because it's rich in platelets. And platelets, you can think of them like little molecules, and they're kind of the drug that we're injecting into the body to help it to heal. Platelets have something called growth factors and something called cytokines. Now, the cytokine profile is the key to how, what determines if PRP is going to be efficacious. We and, have to talk about that. Yeah, yes. and, and, that's, and that's the biggest issue with this whole PRP field is there's no standardization when it comes to PRP. Do you have a thousand clinics offering PRP now and no one's doing it. No one's majority of them are, a are not measuring cytokines and B majority of them don't even know what they're doing when they're injecting the stuff or what they're injecting. And the reason is because where are they getting their PRP? It's just some manufacturer who's some rep that comes from the, some company who makes PRP and they're like, here, use this machine. Our machine's the best. But wait, <laughs> but, but if it's a PRP, so a PRP would be considered plasma rich, um, plasma rich, platelet platelet -rich plasma or platelet rich plasma, would be considered a biologic, right? It, it comes would be. from the person. Yes. And everybody's probably plasma is different. Exactly. And is there a way in real time to determine the the foundations of what is in that plasma to say, okay, well, you have, this is leukocyte rich plasma at this number, this is going to be effective for your shoulder injury. There is now something called a platelet counter, which you can use. And you can, and that's, and that was one of the things we were using because we had a scientist on our team with Tony, uh, Dr. Gallia, and he, and what he, and he was the first one, as far as I know, really talking about the cytokine profile. And that's where I learned from him. And that, and that was the reason why he pioneered a second generation plasma called Cytorich, but that one was essentially to make and increase the anti-inflammatory cytokines. So there's something called interleukin receptor antagonist or IRAP. And there's another company called 
that has something called orge- uh, orthokine and regenokine. And that's that's made from Germany. That was by Peter Willing. And the reason why that one was getting a lot of attention was because people were calling it a second generation PRP because it had more anti-inflammatory cytokines than the original PRP. And now what Cytorich had was IRAP, but then it also had something called TIMPs, which are tissue inhibitor metalloproteinases. And this all comes from the person or this was- This was all from the person. Okay. So TIMPs target MMP, specifically MMP9, which is uh, made matrix metalloproteinases, mm-hmm. and which are one of the catabolic cytokines that degrade cartilage. And so that's why you can enhance PRP using these methods. So you're better targeting the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are causing the chronic inflammation and the degradation of the joint. So you have this kind of progression of PRP from like first generation where you're just kind of mixing it and hoping it works to second generation where you're trying to standardize it a little bit more by standardizing the cytokine profile. But the issue is, as you were saying, is that it really depends on who you're taking it from. Because if you have, and there's been studies on this, if you take a 70-year-old and take their PRP and compare it to a 20-year-old, 20, 20 there's a very vast difference in terms of cytokine profile, in terms of antibiotic growth factors in terms of anti-inflammatory cytokines. So of course, there's going to be variability in efficacy because you're only targeting so many cytokines and the number of those is going to decrease as you get older. Hmm. And so So, that was one of our biggest interventions. And then we also had something called autologous committed progenitor cells. Autologous... Per- committed com- progenitor cells. I know it's Can a lot of- have uh, like an acronym for that? <laughs> I wish. So this is what is erroneously described by every, almost every physician in the United States, except maybe a few who I can, you know, Dr. Steve Sampson, who's amazing, but maybe there's only a few who don't call it that, but they all call it stem cells. It's not stem cells. It's a committed progenitor cell. I'm very glad to hear you say that because when we hear stem cells, it's it's not a thing. You no. do not- It is, is illegal it, in the it, USA think I, to do I was actually, mesenchymal stem cells. So I, anyone <laughs> offering you stem cells is- telling you a lie and you need to be careful because they are uneducated and they do not understand the science of mesenchymal stem cells. I'm very, very grateful to hear you say that. Yes. Uh, a toggle, to- whatever, <laughs> yeah. committed progenerative cells. Yes. That is one treatment. The, that's, that's where your we take treatment. your fat or your bone marrow and we concentrate and we isolate the progenitor cells Committed meaning they can only differentiate into certain cell lineages, but they don't really have much differentiation capacity. So these aren't really turning into new cells. What they're doing is they're doing something called paracrine signaling, which means they're helping to reduce inflammation and help to improve the microenvironment where the chronic inflammation is occurring as an osteoarthritis. So they still can be beneficial, but you just people need to understand when doctors are telling you you're getting a stem cell injection, it is not a stem cell injection. It is an anti-inflammatory signal that can last for a couple of years, which is still great. I mean, that's still helpful, Mm -hmm. but it's not, A, it's not regenerating new tissue. And I think that's what a lot of patients think. They're like, oh, I'm getting stem cells, I'm getting new tissue. And that's where I think a lot of, there's a lot of predatory, unfortunately, doctors in this field because they're they're making false promises. And just to clarify, when you say fat or bone marrow, um, does it matter, is the fat, is this similar to like a cytokine profile? If an individual has I, I hesitate to say the word healthy fat. If someone <laughs> right. is lean, let's say an individual. No, for sure. There has been studies on that. So they're, they're essentially the fat that you collect, you're isolating what's called the stromal vascular fraction, SVF. And that SVF that you collect has all the cytokine profiles in there, but that's going to be very contingent on the st- health status of the individual. And most people have, as you know, as you're the one who coined this term, if fat is the organ of inflammation. And so if you are in this inflammatory state, as many patients are who are overweight, because overweight goes hand in hand with osteoarthritis, then is that really a thing that you want to inject into people in the first place? And I don't know if it is. I, I'm not. I'm not keen to inject that into people's joints. I was using fat only as a scaffold for, for example, if you have a large rotator cuff tear, say if it's fully torn, you can't just put stem cells in there or exosomes or PRP, whatever you use, because they're not viscous enough. So they're just going to go straight 
through. So you need something to hold it and hold act as a bridge. And that's what the fat does. We, so what we do is as a fat, we use it as what's called micro fragmented fat graft. And this is a procedure that was actually invented by plastic surgeons because they use it for the cheeks, for the butt, and you know, for cosmetic applications. Mm -hmm. But so it's not a new procedure, but we're just using it in an orthopedic application where we're using it as a scaffold and then we can seed it with whatever substance that we want, whether it's PRP or stem cells. And then that can help to act as a bridge to actually regenerate the tissue. And that's kind of the holy grail of regenerative medicine in the first place. It's cells, signals, and scaffolds. So that's an easy way to remember. I love it. <laughs> cells, signals, and scaffolds. Yes. I'll take it. Yeah. And would that be, that would be considered, that would someone would call that a fat graft. Yes, fat exactly. Graft. Thank you to Thesis for sponsoring this episode of the show. Thesis is the world's first customized nootropic company. Nootropics are nutrients found in nature or the human body that enhance cognitive function. Let's face it, we all need that. We need focus. We need energy. We need, I do I dare say it, motivation, confidence, clarity, et cetera. That is what Thesis delivers. This is not one size fits all approach. This is a customized approach. You will go to the website, takethesis.com slash Dr. Lyon, take the quiz. And what will happen is because they have a huge database of information, they will pick out the formulations that will be best adapted to you and your brain function. Extraordinary. You'll get a starter kit with four different blend recommendations to try over the course of the month. This is what I have done, and it has been a game changer for me. Go to takethesis.com slash Dr. Lion, take the quiz, use the code. You guys will absolutely love this product. I have been using them for years and I have found them to be extraordinary. Number three. So bone marrow aspirate, which is, again, autologous committed progenitor cell, but except using fat, we're using bone marrow. And what does autologous mean? It just means from your own body versus allogeneic or allogenic, which is using a donor. And we'll talk about why allogenic is probably better because... Oh, really? Yeah, we'll, we'll go into it. Because, it, because al the biggest reason allogeneic is better is because you can standardize the dosing and you can control it. And cell standardization is kind of the biggest challenge in regenerative medicine because we want to make cells like drugs. We want to be able to control exactly what we're putting into your body and make sure they're releasing what we want them to release and they stay there for a definitive amount of time and they're doing what we want them to do. So if we can engineer cells and control them, that's the biggest challenge right now and we'll go into how we're doing that. But that's, that's kind of the holy grail, so to speak, of cell therapy. And so bone marrow aspirate is a committed progenitor cell because as we talked about, you're not really isolating the stem cell. You're just taking the bone marrow from the back of your hip or the front of your hip and you're just isolating that and then you may spin it and then you concentrate it and then you inject it back in. And that can help to reduce inflammation maybe for two or three years, help with tendon pain and, and whatnot. So, and then the other, I would say, common treatment that we did was something called prolotherapy. So prolotherapy initially started out as just dextrose and saline. And that's, people are probably wondering, why are you injecting sugar water? <laughs> right? Sounds weird. I know it, it does. I've also had that done. Oh, okay, great. So I've had number one, two, and four done. Oh, wow. So okay. <laughs> so you're, so you're, you're well versed in this then. Uh, Un unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And so prolotherapy, as you probably know, then is essentially to try to proliferate ligaments to help them stabilize and support the structures. And the reason we do that is for instability, or even sometimes with patients who have ehlers down syndrome or may have dislocations of joints. Uh, and then we want to stabilize them and try to avoid surgery. And so prolotherapy started off as sugar water, but now it's really advanced to the point where personally what we're doing now is we're actually using either PRP, like a leukocyte rich PRP, because Can that's- Can you differentiate? There's leukocyte rich PRP and leukocyte poor PRP. Right. So what that means is, is the PRP that you're using, does it have white blood cells in there or does it not have white blood cells? And why is that important is because white blood cells are going to actually trigger more inflammation. So you want that if you have like, for example, a muscle tear or if you have ligament instability because you want to trigger that inflammatory cycle to help regenerate that tissue or strengthen it, so to speak. But you don't want to put white blood cells into a joint. So because that's going to, because osteoarthritis is an inflammatory environment. So you want to use leukocyte pore or something called platelet lysate, which is where you filter out the cells completely and you're just using the cytokine profile and the anti-inflammatory signals. So that's, that's where 
those nuances become very important because if you use the wrong type of PRP for the wrong indication, you're not going to get a bad result. And that's why a lot of patients say PRP didn't work for me is because they're not even using the right PRP to begin with. And that's where it, you have to also have this kind of ground, I would say, framework of how to progress and understand the different therapies, which a lot of doctors don't, unfortunately, because they've all, either they've they just went straight to stem cells or they never got the proper training with PRP. So they don't really understand the application for each one. And so they're just offering patients, you know, whatever they think based off their toolbox of whatever's limited. And it's not, it's not often very systematic. And so, so that is, and then so prolotherapy, what we're doing now as instead of just dextrose and saline, we're often using leukocyte rich PRP because that'll trigger inflammation or we're even using bone marrow because bone marrow is also pro-inflammatory because of the red blood cells and everything. And that can help to s strengthen and tighten the ligaments. And I'll often now mix it with something like copper peptide because copper peptide can help to also facilitate collagen deposition, which is what you want for the ligaments. Mm. Those are amazing treatments. You'd mentioned something that I think is important to point out is typically when we have a issue, for example, what are the most common complaints or issues that, uh, again, your population was a bit different because I'm assuming that they were very athletic. And we already know that 50% of Americans don't work out. But even um, with that being said, there are probably uh, more significant issues. For example, when we look at how many knee replacements, how many hip replacements, what are the most frequent issues that people come in for? Yeah, by far it is osteoarthritis. And then <laughs> chronic pain. Yeah, because chronic pain, most of it is osteoarthritis. But then there's also a huge subset of patients who fall into this chronic pain category and are labeled as fibromyalgia, which is basically a catch-all term for just saying you have chronic pain, but they don't really know what it is. So they just call you a fibro patient. And to me, that's it's, it's really a disservice because a lot of physicians aren't just willing to dig deeper into what's causing the pain. And so we understand now there's this really kind of link between dysfunction of the immune system and chronic pain. So what's something called neurogenic inflammation, which is infl inflammation at a cellular level around the nerves, which can trigger this pain cycle. And so what we try to do is we help to break that pain cycle. And we're learning more and more sophisticated ways to do that by combining peptides by combining cell therapy and sometimes just looking at more intensive diagnostics even and figuring out like we were talking about before the show like it could be a chronic infection or could it be mitochondrial dysfunction or all these other things that are root drivers as to why their body's in this dysfunctional state and there's something called isn't it uh, complex regional pain syndrome yes yeah i remember when i i had a patient uh, so before i did family medicine i did psychiatry for two years oh and it was really interesting because um I worked in a psychiatric emergency room and a patient had come in and they actually triaged her to, to psychiatry and she had complex regional pain syndrome. Yeah. And um, people were like, oh, there's no way she needs this many pain meds, et cetera. But uh, what I'm hearing you say is that was probably neurogenic inflammation. Yeah, exactly. And then the other common driver, and this is also with obesity, as you are probably well aware, because Gabor Mate's work, adverse childhood events and unresolved emotional trauma, that often can be a risk factor or predictor of chronic pain as well. And so one of the procedures we do for that is to kind of reset the nervous system as well. Would that be a stellate ganglion block or something similar? Yes, exactly. Stellate ganglion, but we also inject the vagus nerve at the same time. Instead of just using anesthetic, we're using exosomes and peptides as well. So it's modulating or reprogramming the nervous system, and it's also reducing inflammation. It's not just blocking it. Because that block only lasts usually for three months. But the approach that we're taking, we're seeing patients do well even a year later, and a lot of them don't have to come back. So that's that's the difference, I think, when you're using these regenerative substances, so to speak, because they're reprogram or retraining the system to function better long term. And I have a there's a, a really good review. There's a handful of really good review papers, but to clarify for the listener, exosomes are membranous vesicles with a 30 to 150 nanometer diameter secreted by mesenchymal stem or slash stromal cells and other cells such as immune cells and cancer cells. Um, the easier way to remember it is imagine you have chicken soup and the chicken, the meat part is the stem cells and the broth is the exosomes. And so the exosomes is essentially the fluid with all the cytokines and signaling molecules and what's called the secretome that we think that most of the benefits of the mesenchymal stem cells 
derives from anyway. So, and that's where there's a lot of debate. Do we even need the stem cells for, for example, for a lot of musculoskeletal conditions? Do you really need the stem cells? Because the exosomes are probably the main driver of the healing process anyway. And this still isn't fully elucidated, but I personally, the way I practice, I'm often using exosomes for most of my musculoskeletal applications, unless they have advanced osteoarthritis, because then you need those stem cells to really modify that disease environment. And this is a clarifying question. We're talking a lot about the knee joint for osteoarthritis. Exosomes, I want to hear more about that because that is definitely a hot topic. And then the next question is, where is the injection? For example, if someone has a muscle tear versus a a tendinopathy or a, again, a ligament tear, how do we differentiate what we're using and what would the impact be of if we were to just look at the exosomes on a on a high a high level what yeah. are they how so the, are and we this is where projecting it? I, I don't know if it was einstein but i remember there's this quote somewhere i remember reading where you can't innovate unless you have a good foundation say that again <laughs> you cannot innovate without a good foundation that is extremely important because you know people i'm sure they ask you how did you get to do what you are doing and the reality is it's you have spent years studying and once you spend years studying then you have aha moments but you cannot fake your way to being good at it you cannot fake your way to become a scholar to be able to innovate yeah unfortunately there's no shortcuts unless you're a super genius maybe but <laughs> for us mere mortals who are normal uh you have to really do the hard work and because i had that foundation with dr gallia i understood that hey let's look at the cytokine pro profile of exosomes so and do ex exosomes exist in the body they do. But exosomes are not only for therapeutic purposes now, they're also being used for, for diagnostic purposes. Because exosomes are like these cargo messengers that allow for intracellular communication. And what happens with disease processes, for example, like cancer, the exosome, the cargo messenger actually changes. And you can detect that before they even manifest full-blown cancer. So exosomes are an ex it's exploding in terms of not just therapeutic applications, but diagnostic as well. Because there's something called microRNAs, and there's all these different molecules that the exosomes carry, and there's different prognostic kind of markers that we can look at that can tell us, hey, your exosome cargo is changing. So this, therefore, this is the disease you're going to most likely develop. And that's going to become more and more sophisticated as time goes on. But for therapeutic purposes, what we want to look at, as we talked about earlier, the foundation is cytokine profile. So what's the cytokine profile of exos like of a standard exosome that we're deriving, for example, from umbilical cord tissue? Yeah, it's where, where do exosomes come from? So as you were saying in your long definition there, <laughs> mesenchymal stem cells. And listen, we got, we've got uh, <laughs> physicians that listen. We have everybody that yeah. listens. So uh, yeah. accuracy is important. It is. Yeah, no, exactly. So, uh, so, that, so as per that definition, they're coming from different mesenchymal stem cells. And where do mesenchymal stem cells come from? They come from umbilical cord tissue, umbilical cord blood, or even bone marrow or fat. And then you isolate those stem cells and then you culture and expand them. And then when you culture expand them, that the soup or the broth that they grow in, so to speak, in the expansion, the culture medium, that's what you can isolate. And that's what has those cytokines and just the growth factors and no actual stem cells. And so those exosomes, it turns out, have 10 times more cytokine profile than PRP. The so exosomes have 10 times more of a beneficial cytokine profile than PRP. Yes. Will this make PRP obsolete? It will eventually as the cost of exosomes comes down. Yes, because most people are not saving their umbilical cord. No, exactly. Or because in the US, ironically enough, you can store it, but then you can't use it for <laughs> unless unless you have some sort of really, you know, uh, maybe, a, a, you know, emergency medical need or something like that. But like for in, your for, umbilical cord. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of crazy. But you can't just use it the way you want to use it. Uh, so the exosomes, the cytokine profile isn't, isn't two times stronger. I always say it's, it's an order of magnitude, right? So it's, it's not- an order of magnitude stronger. So, so that's why it's hard for people to understand. I've had many ho professional hockey players, for example, because I'm in, in Canada, I treat a lot of hockey players. Those and, Canadians. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so they had PRP done and it didn't work for them. And then we did exosomes and it worked for them. And they were kind of like, 
they were asking me why, and I, I, you know, this is why I had to explain to them. It has to do with the cytochrome profile. The signal of the PRP wasn't strong enough to tell your body to regenerate and repair this tissue, but the signal from the exosome is strong enough to regenerate and repair tissue. And when it comes to soft tissue and musculoskeletal conditions, we're talking tendon, ligaments, muscles. And so that's the big difference between exosomes and PRP. And then mesenchymal stem cells, they're, they're about 20 times stronger than PRP. So not... 10 times stronger than exosomes, but maybe two times stronger when it comes to mm. cytokine profile. So it's not that much stronger than exosomes. And that's why I think we still have to figure out the dosing for a lot of these things to figure out, okay, what's the perfect dosing for the specific indication? And there's still a lot of data that's coming out for us to kind of guide us on what the best dosing protocols are. And the exosomes, you said that obviously there's a number of ways in which we could retrieve them. And do you spin them down? Yes. Okay. Alter centrifuge. So you okay? So you do that, but it seems also that they are for sale or have been for sale. Yeah. Uh, I'd love because again, when we are discussing these things, is there an FDA approval for? It's interesting in the U.S. and Canada, I believe that they are not FDA approved. Is that no? True? And they're not Health Canada approved. So, but in other countries, they are. Yes. I always bring up Japan because the Japanese do everything to very rigorous standards. For people who have been there, they obviously know the cleanliness, the food, but it also applies to their medicine and technology. Like they they have some of the best surgeons in the world when it comes to innovative techniques. And no other than Professor Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for his discovery on how to reprogram stem cells, is obviously from Japan too. So they, they have a culture of innovation and wanting to always improve themselves. And they've created a regulatory framework for regenerative medicine that's 10 years old now. And 10 years old. And they've been they, around for a long time. And the US and Canada still don't have a regenerative medicine framework. So instead of creating a framework and regulating these things, they just said, we're just going to ban them. Hmm. And to me, that makes no sense. And I think, I think this is much more political than it is based in science. And yes, j you can use the anecdote of J uh, Japan, but there's also so much clinical data out there now. Plus, you have to look at the risk versus benefit of any intervention, or what we call in medicine, number needed to treat versus number needed to harm, right? NNT versus NNH. And so we, exosomes are, because they're acellular, so there's no cells in there, they have a very high safety profile. There's, there's no chance of rejection. There's no chance of having tumors form. And, and by the way, you say tumors form. One of the biggest uh, criticisms, I think, of this regenerative medicine space is, are you giving cells that would then go and differentiate into something else and cause cancer or proliferate an existing cancer that one is unaware that they have? Would you say that that's accurate? That was always a concern. And that's why you have to be careful. And that's why the word stem cell is meaningless, because is it a mesenchymal stem cell? Is it a hematopoietic stem cell? Is it an embryonic stem cell? Is it an induced pluripotent stem cell? Where, what, what are you talking about when you're talking about stem cells? And so there's all these different types and they have different profiles and they have different capacity to differentiate into tissue. And some of them can turn into tumors and some of them can't. So you have to understand those kind of nu nuanced differences to really be able to counsel a patient and then make them feel rest assured that whatever we're using isn't going to make the risk of cancer worse if you do have cancer in your body or cause cancer. If someone has cancer, and I usually save this for the yes or no um, question, so we'll do a, a yes or no <laughs> question. Maybe I'll, I'll do that later, which we will. But if an individual has cancer, would that be a contraindication to treatment? For exosomes. For exosomes, I would say it's a gray area, meaning that the studies that have been out there, some of them suggest that it can actually improve. The, For example, there's been studies looking at combining exosomes or mesenchymal stem cells with chemotherapy, and there's been better outcomes. And then there's other studies suggesting that they may, because of the growth factors, they may cause proliferation. So from all the data that I've gathered and the best available evidence, it seems like it's a neutral effect. And in that case, I always take the most more conservative option. So meaning if you have active cancer, I wouldn't recommend doing a systemic treatment of exosomes or stem cells because we just because there may be a risk of it getting worse. But but outside of active cancer, there isn't any other really uh, contraindications. And we've and that's really just for exosomes. We've covered PRP uh, briefly. We've uh, covered the atog. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna that one committed <laughs> progenerative cells. We've also talked about bone marrow aspirates and prolotherapy exosomes. And I think that you're the 
final piece to that is also gene therapy. Yeah. Or is there additional interventions, regenerative interventions that you would want to mention? So the one that I'm most excited about is the iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. Induced pluripotent stem cells. And thank goodness that Dr. Khan is going to allow us to say iPSCs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, or if you want to just say Yamanaka stem cells, that also works. Um, I don't know what's easier. But. And, the, and is that, that's interesting. Is that related to the Yamanaka factor? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So the four transcription factors, OSK uh, and then CYMC. So that, that's kind of the short form of it. But basically these four transcription factors, when we use so the way it works is you can take any somatic cell in your body. And somatic just means body cell. Yes. So like muscle, fat, and you can reprogram it by inserting these four transcription factors, usually using a viral vector. And it what it does is these four transcription factors overexpress overexpress pluripotent genes. And, and what's then, that? What's a pluripotent gene? So pluripotency is essentially the ability to differentiate it into different cell lines or different types of tissue. So but this pluripotent, these four are pretty incredible because they have this amazing ability to turn the somatic cell into the epitome of a pluripotent cell, which is embryonic stem cells. Why why embryonic stem cells? Because they can turn into ectoderm, mesoderm, or um, endoderms. Like So any basically anything from the embryonic origin. And so by being able to do that, that means that these cells have the most stemness but then the downside of it has always been because they have so much stemness, they could turn into tumors or teratomas. Right. And that's why I... And wait, and just for people listening, a teratoma, do you want to explain that is like the ultimate in med school where it's a, a tumor that has... Could have teeth. It could oh right, have yes, yeah. A hairball in it. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of scary. Like, it's like a kind of a scary, like almost fetus-like thing growing inside Correct. your body that you don't want it there. Trust me. By the way, <laughs> if you are in med school or going to med school, this will be on your boards. Yeah, seriously, it was. The I feel like everyone, everyone had that on their boards. Yes, the, the teratoma. <laughs> yeah, I always think of like a hair, like a scary little know, like fur ball or something I, I, growing inside. I wake of you. up in the middle of the night thinking about the teratoma. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so iPSCs were these. This is incredible discovery. And this is by Yamanaka. Yes. In in Japan, yes. In this, and he won the Nobel Prize for this. Yes, specifically. Ten years ago, he won the. He discovered this in two thousand six, and won the Nobel Prize in twenty thirteen, I think. And so it's been around for a while, but then no one could figure out how do we take these iPSCs and use them clinically because with that we don't want to cause cancer. So that didn't stop people from doing it. I, let, let me. So, but it, but to me, I'm always about safety, and I don't want to put something in my body that I think may make things worse. And I'm always, you know, first do no harm, right? And so I think there are people using iPSCs, but you got to be careful because there is that probably 1% chance of having cancer development. And so Thank you to Element for sponsoring this episode of the show. You guys have heard me talk all about Element. This is an electrolyte powder. Comes in cute little packets that you can travel with. Has sodium, potassium, magnesium. I am a two-pack-a-day drinker of Element. I travel with it. I use it before I speak. I use it on a daily basis. It has really helped me maintain hydration. The truth is I don't drink a ton of plain water and uh, I really feel it. Element has allowed a solution in my life and you guys, I'm incredibly grateful. If you are someone who struggles with drinking water, even getting headaches or muscle cramps or fatigue, these can all be symptoms of electrolyte insufficiency or deficiency or lack of fluid. You will love Element. Go to drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. When you order, you'll also get eight flavors. You'll get this cute little packet that has eight different flavors. You can try all eight. If you don't like it, it's totally risk-free. Element offers a no questions asked refund. Go to drink lmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. And now IPSC, how would someone, um, would they purchase it? Would they just broadly, the IPSC, does someone purchase it? Does someone have it? 
they so usually we take it from a skin cell because that's the easiest way to reprogram because the skin cells are easily accessible so you could just take a skin biopsy and then you use the yamanaka factors and then you reprogram you it inoculate it or yeah and you reprogram it and then you you do so, uh, you know uh, you look at the colony that's sort of made from that reprogramming and you validate it and make sure it has all the expressions that you would expect to see in ipsc in real time does this take weeks? this takes weeks yeah and then this happens in the background in the lab and then we can differentiate those ipsc into different cell lines. And does it need to come from the person's body? It can be autologous or it can be allogenic. You're, you're <laughs> laughing because the autologous word is just my nemesis <laughs> yeah, today. Yeah, No, you got it now. So, I or, mean, listen, both my little kids kept me up laughing. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, or, or you can do allogeneic, which means from a donor. And we'll talk about why I think that's better. But basically, once you reprogram them, now you have these iPSCs. And the cool thing about iPSCs is unlike just MSCs, which are from umbilical cord tissue. What does MSC stand for? The mesenchymal stem cells. Sorry, a lot of jargon, but well, we're, <laughs> we'll, that's okay. We are we're going to power through it. It's yeah. good. It's it's important information because it is a branch of medicine that is getting a lot more steam and has been global at yeah. this point. And we are late adopters, not early adopters, not even middle of the ground adopters. And because of the unregulatory nature of this, it's given a potential therapy a very bad name. It has. Exactly. And I and that's and that's actually why I didn't want to go into it. Cause I knew about this stuff maybe in 2017 or something, but I was just like, oh, this is like scammy. And I saw, you know, Mel Gibson on Joe Rogan show and talking about his house dad went, I'm like, this sounds like nonsense. Like what is this? And then obviously I had to do a lot of research and then I got into it myself. And then when you see the results and then you dig into research a bit, then you start seeing the promise of it. But then you still see that there is a lot of bad players in the space too, who are offering it, 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 the wrong things. And so so the iPSCs though, the main difference between what they can do and what the mesenchymal stem cells that are from umbilical cord tissue can do is that they can actually engraft and regrow new tissue versus the first generation let's call that first generation stem cells versus second generation stem cells. The first generation is ma mainly going to be anti-inflammatory or immunomodulatory. And would that be a differentiating factor if you were to choose how are you going to treat or or the the level of treatment required? Yes. So for example, if you have something that's really degenerative in nature, like Parkinson's disease, using MSCs, first generation is only going to have maybe a symptom management. And, and how, would that, how would that work? Would that be you can, so, you can do injections directly into the brain. We have a neurointerventional radiologist on our team, for example, who guides a catheter up into the carotid artery, and then he can inject it, or he can actually go directly into the brain and inject the stem cells that way. Mm -hmm. But the mesenchymal stem cells, the first generation, they'll mainly reduce inflammation. They'll help with neuroinflammation, which we know is a driver. There's mitochondrial dysfunction. It'll kind of address like the different let's say, hallmarks that are part of the ha mechanistic pathways of Parkinson's disease, but it's not going to cure it or put it into remission. But the second generation, what you can do with iPSCs is you can differentiate them, for example, into dopamine-producing neurons. And then when you differentiate them... That's fascinating. Yeah. And for those listening, Parkinson's is uh, really this degeneration of the substantia nigra and um, it leads to movement disorders. It depletes dopamine. Basically, what we have, there's just a handful of drugs that we that we have old drugs, which old, are basically very old just, drugs like L-dopa, <laughs> yeah. uh, Sentiment, a uh, very old drugs yeah. that typically people will have to continue to increase their their dose exactly, and which are just basically managing the symptoms. And again, there's nothing wrong with that paradigm, uh, but there is now because we have better options, and so <laughs> and so the the you know the kind of quintessential example of this is blue rock therapeutics which is this company that has these ipscs and then they differentiate them into dopamine producing neurons and then they transplant them uh, via injections into the substantia nigra and then guess how what, effective is that and guess what it actually replaces or not it doesn't replace it actually engrafts new cells that produce dopamine is and so that... it actually puts patients into remission and they did one year follow up study and they showed these patients were still doing well and they had two dosages and the dose the higher group dosage was doing better how often is that being used now as a standard of care it's not standard of care yet because standard of care remember even PRP is not standard of care still and like or even an option for people only is still joint replacement and cortisone essentially so i think standard of care for to get into mainstream medicine is going to take a long time but that doesn't mean these therapies aren't efficacious and can still be offered in jurisdictions where they have a regulatory framework 
to allow people to do this safely and and for you know with the right indications. Is IPSC for the treatment of Parkinson's used in other countries more routinely? Yes, like Japan. Japan. <laughs> yeah, and then so that's where I see and and why Japan because they're they're discoverers of IPSC. And so. is this a hundred percent? It, if an individual is given this, this IPSC that is now differentiated into part of uh, cells in the substantia nigra, is it 100% remission for 100% of the patients? Is it a 50-50 shot? No, it was It was essentially, it was, it was just a dose-dependent response, meaning the group that had the higher dose had a better response, but everyone had a response and the magnitude of that response differed. But patients were essentially in the higher dose were in, into remission. Now the question is, how, how will that last permanently? We don't know yet, but my, my guess is yes, because you're actually fixing the problem and you're actually addressing the root cause as to why this happened in the first place. Now, I think maybe a missing component of that is to make sure that you're addressing the root causes as to why you got the Parkinson's in the first place. I think that's the missing piece with the current trials. And that's what we're going to be looking at is we're not. So the IPSCs that we have, we reprogram them using similar technology, but ours have, we have a patented gene edit technology called failsafe, which basically prevents uncontrolled proliferation. Because you're saying that these that there is some risk with yes. Yeah, so IP- even though that Blue Rock therapeutic use the iPSCs, there's still probably the scientists I've talked to who are experts in this field. They say there's probably still one percent chance that these people could get tumors, and so obviously these patients are willing to take that risk because they have Parkinson's and they're willing to take that. But for me, obviously, if I'm going to provide this to my patients, I want to use a technology that has a built-in safety mechanism into it, and hence why I like the technology that we have, which we work with the company to, to develop it, is essentially. It has that a gene edit. So if the cells start growing uncontrollably, it has this kill switch, meaning it'll stop the cells from proliferating. And is there a certain type of tumor that is maybe proliferating? It's usually teratomas, from what I understand. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the teratoma. teratoma yeah. I thought I'd never hear about that again. Very, very fascinating. How else are or how else are these IPSC? So first of all, Parkinson's is not that common. It is not, I mean, we do see it, you know, I saw it when I was doing my fellowship and it definitely was believed that in part due to a lot of exposures, a lot of uh, veterans, I think that there is a a mis, a disproportionate amount of veterans that have been exposed to things like Agent Orange or other things that we may or may not, we don't necessarily know about seem to develop these neurodegenerative exactly. uh, illnesses. And, th- and that's where I think the missing piece is with the current trials. So the trials that we're planning to do, we want to take more of a functional medicine approach, which is not just engraft the new cells, but also look at all the potential causes. And because there's thousands of toxins in the environment. And we even, for example, there was a study that came out last year that showed that there's certain microbes that gut dysbiosis that are linked to Parkinson's disease as well. Yeah. So there's the gut component too, which is not something you would think, but gut brain access is really being elucidated now in terms of how they communicate. How else are iPSCs for an individual who doesn't have Parkinson's or not really looking at neurodegeneration? What are some of the other benefits? And is Japan the only place someone could go to get this done? No, well, we're going to be offering it in our regions where we can, like in in you know Mexico. Uh, we're we're working in Bahamas, working on developing one in Bahamas. We have Dubai, uh, and then Cairo is going to be ready sometime later this year as well. Um, and then we're also looking into uh, Switzerland. And and again, the reason for these places is because the jurisdictions there allow for these things, uh, and they they're regulated. It's not like they're not regulated. They just have a framework, and they allow for more innovative therapies. And so. What we're we're going to create we're creating right now is IPSC MSC. So IPSCs, but are differentiated into mesenchymal stem cells or stromal cells. And what you can do is you can enhance these MSCs to better target the inflammasome. So and the inflammasome for another uh, jargon here is the NLRP3 we pathway. We just have to look over at Matthew. Does he look confused? Are you? He's like he's confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Matthew's the producer. He's here. Uh, just call him out. And anytime he looks confused, we know we have to I'm talk just, more. Uh, yeah, I know. It's lot, lots of uh, jargon. But but so for people to understand that inflammasome is arguably one of the most important pathways when it comes to aging, because it triggers what's called nuclear factor kappa B, NFKB, and, and uh, interleukin beta, and all these pro-inflammatory cytokines. But what is an inflammasome? It's a, uh, well, the, by definition, it's basically a caspase-linked 
in English. Yeah. So essentially, it's a it's a it's an enzyme unit that uh, triggers chronic inflammation. Perfect. So the signaling molecule NLRP3 gets activated by certain uh, aging being one of the drivers of it. But there's toxins. There's lots of things in our bodies that can trigger it. And obviously, like exercise can help to counteract that. Right. It's probably the only thing. I- I mean, maybe really significant fasting. I, I again, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but then fasting has so many other downsides. Oh, correct. To it. <laughs> uh, exercise is really the only thing that I can potentially even think of. Exactly. That would make any kind of impact. And and muscle particularly because muscle also helps to upregulate T regulatory cells and has these amino. You don't say. <laughs> you don't say that muscle is the organ of longevity. Yeah, yeah I know. All these people looking for all, all these. Uh, but, Other options. And that's and that's where, so coming back to what people can do, the whole point of doing these treatments that I do is so people can exercise and live a healthy lifestyle. Because if you're tired all the time, if you have chronic pain, if you have trauma, if you have all these other things in your body, good luck telling someone to go exercise three, four times a week and put on muscle. It's true. L- you need to address these issues first, sort them out, then they can live the healthy lifestyle. The compliance is going to be so much higher if they actually feel better and they get the benefits and that kind of feedback loop from exercise. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When we talk about regenerative therapy, you and I are both on the same page. We want people to be as active as they can for as long as they exactly. can. And once an individual, you know, we often think about as individuals age that all of these changes are going to happen. For example, fat infiltration into tissue, sarcopenia, anabolic resistance of skeletal muscle, But mitochondrial dysfunction, the data and the research when we see healthy, quote, sedentary individuals and they talk about these hallmarks of aging, that's a diseased population. If we can keep people exercising and moving, then the trajectory of aging doesn't have to be the way that we experience it to be. Yeah. And what these cell and gene therapies are designed to do is to allow you to do these interventions for a longer period of time. Because as you get older, if you're, for example, if you're in your 70s and 80s, you might not have the energy anymore, or you might just be in, you might just be really, you're really fighting this uphill battle. And so if we can make your body more resilient, so that when you do these inputs for your body, they're, they're just going to allow you to do more longer. And, and- and right. that's where the intravenous, and so you're, to your question, for example, something like intravenous stem cells that can actually be used for recovery to help with HRV and to slow down the aging process is not because I care about all the mechanistic stuff that they do. Yes, great. They target all these different hallmarks and there's all these mechanistic data. But what I really care about is that- it's Outcomes. Gonna, exactly. And what has the best outcome? Grip strength, which is such a silly proxy, but that's it one is of the so silly. I just but, go back and forth about grip strength. Yeah, but that, but that's, but there's mortality data showing that hey, grip strength can. It, so what about a, like an actual squat, and what about myosteatosis into the rec fam and glute, mm-hmm. uh, glute, right? Like those are better predictors of mortality. And so if we can do these anti aging treatments, what I mean by anti aging is that it's just going to allow you to work out longer and do it with more compliance, hopefully. Yeah, and from uh, just a big picture view. If you have knee arthritis or osteoarthritis, it limits your mobility. You're not wanting to walk. You're not wanting to squat. You're not wanting to do these things. If you have a hamstring tear or a a tendinopathy, a bicep tendinopathy or a shoulder injury, then it really limits your quality of life. I mean, I can't tell you the number of patients that have had uh, sciatica. Yeah. Chronic sciatica, which is a a compression of the pure, is a depending, a pair of yeah. will compress or in the this spine, sciatic yeah, nerve, nerve yeah. or spinal depending, nerve. Depending, yeah. and it just debilitates people yeah. that have been athletes their whole oh, yeah. life. Yep. And the question becomes is, how do we do early interventions to allow people to be, are you ready, Matthew, forever strong? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> how do we do early interventions to begin to mitigate these, these things? In terms of, and that's really the musculoskeletal, tendon, ligament, cartilage piece. What you're talking about now is something else, which is IV. Do I even say stem cell? Yeah. Okay, I can say IV IV stem cell. And that would be different. That would be a full body regeneration. But I do want you to clarify, would that get to something like a shoulder injury? Or is it you go under general anesthesia, you address the shoulder with whether it's 
PRP or exosomes, et cetera, and you do IV stem cells, it, where is the line and are they two separate things? Do they both need to be done? How how can we yeah. think about that? It's So the approach that we take and to your to your point is basically there is something called chemokines that are released by tissue inflammation chemokines are signals that tell your body hey come here and repair so they tell macrophages they tell other kind of repair molecules to come and so when you do intravenous stem cells there is a homing mechanism and that homing mechanism is mediated by these chemokines and then that goes into the end of in, into the endothelial cells and that's what allows them to transport and go into the site of injuries so Yes, the intravenous stem cells or and intravenous exosomes that we do can help with nagging injuries, but usually if they're milder, anything that has actual real structural damage and has more moderate pain, then you actually need to go in there directly. And let's and let's pause because when you say structural changes, how are we identifying this? Are we identifying this on ultrasound, MRI? How are we identifying? It's, it's both, but but the missing piece is clinical assessment because. In America, especially, you guys love MRIs. I know. And like I know. in Canada, especially Matthew. Yeah, yeah. But in Canada, it's a finite resource. Meaning, it is <laughs> you. You're lucky if you can. In you, Canada, there's a six you month get wait. An X-ray. Yeah, exactly. You're lucky. There's a six you're month not... wait for an MRI. You ain't getting an MRI yes. tomorrow. And so, if, if or in the next six years. Yeah, exactly. So, thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. I believe that blood work and biomarkers are critical to your success at living a muscle-centric life and being able to look at data points for longevity. Inside Tracker makes it so easy. Head over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. You'll get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. This is a great tool. Not only is this a great tool for you, the consumer, but if you are a health coach, if you are a health professional, Inside Tracker is also for you. They offer Inside Tracker Pro, which enables coaches and health professionals to provide premium and personalized services by leveraging Inside Tracker's analysis and recommendation to their clients. And that, you guys, is extraordinary. So thank you, Inside Tracker. You guys are doing a wonderful job. And if you have not gotten your blood work done, people, it's time to rock and roll. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion for 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. So how do we as Canadian physicians figure out how do we treat our patient if we don't have an MRI? We have to do dynamic ultrasound assessments. So we're really good at that. What's that? That's doing different maneuvers to try to aggravate the symptoms so we can actually find small tears. I always like to use the example of Mohammed Alibar because he's this famous man in Dubai and he can he's he he owns a Burj Khalifa and like the six tallest buildings in the world. And the reason I like to use him is because God, what a I mean how I know, what a life, right? Yeah. But so <laughs> he, he should really try to do something with his life. Yeah, yeah seriously. Uh, he just buys hotels on weekends. That's what he does for fun. So, but this but guy can he babysit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but basically, he could access any doctor in the world, right? And so, but but despite that, he had this nagging shoulder issue for twenty years, and he did cortisone, and then they just told him the MRI was normal, so he just did physio, 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 and just did physio every week, basically massage every week for twenty years. Brutal. Yeah, and so that's literally what he did. And so when I came to see him, we did a dynamic ultrasound assessment, and guess what? We found two small tears that were missed on MRI. But interesting the size of the tear doesn't necessarily no, equate to no, the pain. Exactly. And that is important because a lot of people, for example, if I order an MRI, an individual will act, you know, you'll, you'll go through the full gamut of tests and they do have tears and it actually is causing a significant amount of pain and you might not even see it. Exactly. And it, it depends on like if you have fascial tears, for example, fascial tears are notoriously painful and you can have a couple millimeter tear in the fascia and it can cause so much pain. And you can see that on ultrasound? Yes. And wow. only on ultrasound, not on MRI. Wow. And so that's why dynamic ultrasound assessment is the gold standard when it comes to soft tissue injuries. Does someone need but to be- But it's all user dependent. And 
very important point. And is someone under general anesthesia when they're doing this? Or they, no, it's all it's all awake because we need to ask them: Does this mm. replicate your pain? Is this you know? It's it's a very dynamic assessment, and that's the biggest difference between ultrasound and MRI because MRI is just static images, and depending on those static images, for example, even with your spine, if you're not standing up, and you might not find certain things. So because MRIs are obviously done when you're laying down, and so there's there's definitely a lot of gaps when it comes to musculoskeletal care, and that we're we're trying to fill those gaps with kind of the diagnostic maneuvers we have and then obviously the interventional stuff. So So the, wait, so when you see the tear, you're do you treat immediately? Do you treat directly into the injury? Yes, the precision is by far the most important predictor of success. So I've precision seen people is. Yeah, I've seen people go to so many clinics in other places, you know, yes. in South America, let's just say, and they've had bad results because they're just doing IV and then they're just injecting them like either blindly or they just don't know how to inject. They don't have the skill set. Those doctors are unfortunately just not trained in this stuff. And so they don't put in the right spot and then obviously it's not going to work. So that precision of getting it into the right spot really makes a big difference. Hmm, that is fascinating. What happened? Did he get better? Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's great. I fixed his wife as well. His wife had a knee issue. His wife's story was even worse. She, I mean, her pain wasn't as long. It was like six months, but they basically told her she needed a knee replacement and she had like mild osteoarthritis. And we found, we did an ultrasound and she had a tear in her meniscus and pezenserine that was missed. And so we just fixed it with PRP. Mm. And then she was, now she's, you know, she's sleeping. He was so happy. He was happier that I fixed his wife than him because- Is his, he going to buy you a hotel now? <laughs> he, he was Kinda. very generous with his gifts. Let's just say that. Um. That so there is a stratification of when someone would use PRP, yeah, for versus the uh, exosomes or the other IPSC. Yeah. And the IPSC, from what I'm hearing you say, is more for attacking what we would consider the hallmarks of aging. Would yeah, that be exactly. You correct. Can, well, IPSCs you can engineer. These are engineered cells, so you can engineer them to target different conditions. So, for example, but not necessarily an IPSC would not be your first choice for a shoulder injury. No. No, that would be way too expensive and unnecessarily, uh, you know, just <laughs> just going to like the Lamborghini all of a sudden for, you know, there's a stepwise approach you can take and there are less costly solutions that can be just as effective. And so I always like to take the, that. And that's one of the things I consider, too, which a lot of unfortunate other clinics don't, is that they just want to give patient what costs the most and because that's going to make them the most money. And again, being a Canadian doctor where we aren't we don't, we're not really taught about that stuff so much. And that's never been my focus. My focus is always on how do I get this patient better? And now that I'm more in the private industry, I always think, okay, how do I get this patient better with the least cost? And that's, so that's kind of the mindset I try to take when I'm trying to treat these patients. And so IPSCs, you can differentiate them into dopamine producing neurons, for example, for Parkinson's. You can differentiate them into enhanced MSEs to target aging. We're, we're even going to be doing IPSC derived beta islet cells, and we're going to do or the pancreas. Yes, we're going to do a tight. We're going to do a clinical trial. Uh, hopefully, it'll start uh, Q four of this year or early next year, and we're going to differentiate them into beta islet cells, and then we're going to do a trial for type one diabetes. And that's already been done by a company called Vertex. But again, the IPSCs they use didn't have that gene edit. So there's no kill switch. No, exactly. So there's always a risk of tumor. So we have that plus. You know, Vertex is a, you know, they got bought out by Bayer, I believe. So they're, you know, they're obviously under that big pharma conglomerate now, but, but they, they, again, they, they don't understand the functional medicine stuff. So they're not doing anything to pre prevent the autoimmunity from developing again. And they're not looking at the kind of the whole picture. And so when we do our clinical trial, not only are we going to transplant new beta islet cells, we're going to reprogram. Into, does it have to go into the pancreas? Yes. So we do it via infusion of uh, intraarterially uh, under fluoroscopy, basically. Okay. Into the pancreas. Yeah. Wow. So you know it's not going into the kneecap. It no. is going <laughs> yeah. into the pancreas. Yeah. And is there any risk of rejection? Not with these ones specifically, because our IPSCs are also gene edited to be hypoimmune. But in general, IPSCs and MSCs have low HLA expression. So, so HLA is the antigen that can trigger graft versus host disease. And that is, for example, if someone were to get a kidney transplant, you would transplant somebody, you try to get a match, you transplant that into somebody else's body, and there is a risk of the body rejecting that. Yes. And that's and that's because of HLA mismatch. And HLA expression in the cells that we're using are very lowly expressed. So there's zero chance of graft versus host. But because MSC still have a low level expression of HLA, they are still somewhat immunogenic, which is why the first generation MSCs don't stick around very long. They get cleared up by your immune system. So the 
kind of underlying principle of what we're trying to do is we're trying to engineer cells that stick around longer and so aren't cleared up by the immune system as quickly. And then th that we actually have some sort of scaffolding effect because that also creates a protective barrier and allows for more engraftment. So it comes back to that whole paradigm of regenerative medicine, which is cells, signals, and scaffolds. So once we can actually do that, cells, that's the holy grail. Cells, signals, and scaffolds. Yeah. <laughs> I am going to ask a question that I'm sure many physicians are going to be thinking right now. And I'd love your perspective. This idea of the Yamanaka factors and the IPSC, it almost sounds too good to be true in the way that we could potentially reverse, put in remission, debilitating deadly diseases like Parkinson's, like type 1 diabetes. And I'm sure that that is just the tip of the iceberg. It is. Now, from a medical perspective, the physicians listening are going, well, if it sounds too good to be true, it must be too good to be true. And where do you think there is a cap? Where do you think there are potentially holes in this treatment? Or where is, how how can we balance it with this extraordinary possibility? What do you think? Yeah, the, I think the biggest hurdle is getting these cells to actually survive meaning that these cells, there's always a chance they don't survive and then they don't engraft and then, and then it's not successful. But we're getting closer and closer to increasing that cell viability and survivability. And it's not like just me saying it. Like I said, there's actual trials that have already been done and shown that this is possible. So we're just taking it to the next step by engineering cells and kind of create taking into account the whole body so we can create an environment that allows the cells to survive. Mm. Why? And that's that's always been my, I guess, beef with the, with the traditional uh, stem cell clinical trials that have been done. There's no like consideration of the environment that you're putting the cells into. There's no consideration for the environment that you are putting the cells into. That's absolutely correct. And likely one of the reasons why certain things, aside from all the other things that you spoke about, that PRP might not work. Exactly. Or these bone or fat grafts might not work because of the environment that, in which they are coming from, i.e. the individual may um, struggle with obesity, may be chronically inflamed, may have Lyme disease or another type of pathogen that exists within these cells. Exactly. And, there's, and th that stuff is still so overlooked by the yes, it is. medical allopathic industry for yes. there's I think it's just lack of education and you know you don't know what you don't know and so a lot of them just when they cut when you have these specialists who are considered the top in their field from different institutions they're just not taught about this other stuff and so they're they're maybe amazing stem cell biologists and amazing doctors when it comes to neurosurgery or whatever it be but they don't understand this other aspect and so I think the unique advantage of what I'm doing a little bit is that I get to look at everything from a, you know, from a bird's eye view, and then I can take this different approaches and combine them. And, and that's, that's the fun part about doing what I do. <laughs> it's pretty, it's very exciting. The other very exciting part is that you'll be able to innovate. You're in a position to innovate some of these treatments. You guys are going to be running some of these trials. And that makes the primary application once we have real life as and you already have, there's already data out there for real life advantage, can be extraordinarily impactful. It, it can be extraordinarily impactful. You also are excited about certain other things like gene therapy, specifically uh, fulvastatin therapy. I would love for you to talk about that as well, unless there's anything else that you want to mention about IPSC. No, I'm just, I think I've shared my excitement enough and we're going to, I think people will see a lot of IPSC trials coming out over the next decade, really. There's over 40 companies, I believe, biotech companies that are using IPSCs now. So it's exploding. And I think the, you know, I think what, the approach we're taking is one of many. So we'll see who we'll see who's the most successful. But I think it's going to be one of those things where similar to Tesla, I think it's gonna be a winner takes all where there's gonna be a company that has the best approach. And then that's going to be used as a platform to develop all these different engineered cells to treat all these chronic diseases. And people have to recognize what he's also saying is that these are biotech companies, which which mean they will fund research and people will say, oh, well, this research was funded by X, Y, and Z. That is a wrong way of thinking about it. We need companies that have money to fund research. And as long as they go to reputable institutions, these 
this data should be able to be replicated. And exactly. again, you can't throw the baby but, out but with what's, the bathwater. What's a reputable, reputable institution anymore? I don't know if you that, saw this that's stuff a, about Harvard and fake results. And <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> so I, I, I'll say something else. <laughs> then you must go to trusted scientists that are very well respected by their peers. You make a really good point. We There are a lot of issues with the Ivy League institutions and policy and agenda and paid uh, I'll just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So fair. So go to very well known. Like Yamanak is not going to win the Nobel Prize because I mean, listen. I, I was reading a Candace Perth um, biography, so who knows? Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. at some point, science will be replicated. Exactly. Science requires dollars. And we shouldn't turn our nose up if a biotech company is going to help fund research because we need it. Yeah. And that's, need it for the that's always been my approach is that you have to become an institution yourself to make change. And so that's why we're taking this kind of mm. approach from a business perspective and then be able to hopefully get more reproducibility and replicability of results as time goes on. And so speaking of which, the folostatin, we've and published- And what is, is folostatin? So it's a naturally occurring peptide in your body. A peptide, as most people probably know, is just a signal for a specific task. It's kind of like you know, ringing a doorbell in your house and telling, opening a certain door. Has so a bunch it, of amino acids, peptides, a bunch of amino acids all strung together. Yeah, in a different. Yeah, exactly. So insulin was one of the first peptide hormones that was synthesized over 100 years ago. But now, of course, people know Zempic, which, uh, you know, is, is, is a very famous peptide, probably not for all the right reasons. But people know in, in colloquially now, I think, what a peptide is. So, but peptides, as, as you age, many of them do decrease. So folostatin being one of them, Copper peptide being another one that's important for skin youthfulness. And so... What is the main purpose of folostatin? The main purpose... Yeah, the main purpose is to... In, well, the main purpose of folostatin itself is to inhibit myostatin. Mm -hmm. So it has what's called an antagonistic relationship. And what is myostatin? So myostatin is an enzyme that sets a limit on how much muscle you can put on. Uh, and have you ever seen the certified... Have you ever seen... A, well, it's actually a Piedmontese cow. Have you seen a Piedmontese yeah, cow? Yeah. <laughs> and they have a um, a defect in, I, I think that they don't have the myostatin gene. That's right. It's a knockout, basically. It's not, and these are the, and by the way, shout out to certified Piedmontese. This is where you'll get those cows. These are the buffest cows. Yeah, they're you have ever, they're they are jacked. <laughs> yeah. You have ever seen these cows, right? Matthew, do you want a certified Piedmontese cow? A Piedmontese <laughs> cow? Um, and so basically the idea is that, and this is nearly everything in the body has some kind of regulation. If yeah. you don't, this is a one way in which cancer develops. This the, the regulation of muscle mass, which is interesting, in part is by myostatin, yeah. which would inhibit someone's ability to put on muscle. Yeah, exactly. And so it's not like we're knocking it out because that could, like you said, maybe increase the risk of cancer. All we're doing is allowing your body to have a better response to the inputs that are from exercise because that cap, so to speak, is being slightly taken off and allowing more room for your muscles to grow. And the other thing that folostatin does is activate something called FOXO3 pathway. And FOXO3 is a pathway that is reducing inflammation, helping with upregulation of Treg cells. And so it's basically helping with your immune system and immune dysregulation, as we know, is one of the biggest hallmarks or chronic inflammation is one of the biggest hallmarks of aging as well. And is it safe to say that the upregulation of FOX is beneficial? Yes. Yeah. And and the I think the the thing people get concerned about, like you said, is that how do you know you're not causing cancer or anything like that? Uh, you know, in the clinical trial that we did, we obviously measured IGF-1, made sure that didn't go up. And then you also have to look at what I call, and I think you would agree, is what's what's the underlying principle of how this is working? So what's going to be more important, a mechanistic marker that maybe, let's just say theoretically, Falstein did increase IGF-1. Let's. What's going to be more important, that slight increase or you putting on two pounds of muscle and decreasing systemic inflammation? I mean, like you, you know my thoughts. It's not even. And that, also, but, IGF one is not necessarily. It's not that you have an increase in IGF one, and then all of a sudden. But you then get you have cancer. all these people in the longevity community who are talking about fasting and calorie restriction. I can't with them. I can't either. Uh, they, <laughs> it's just like, what do you even? They don't understand the clinical data and hard outcomes versus mechanistic data in animals. This and this is the biggest problem with scientists in general. Scientists are little silos of information. They're not clinicians. They're not clinicians, and that is also the biggest problem that I have. And again, we work with some of the best PhDs whom I love, and they do interface with 
clients, but the majority of scientists doing these things like uh, talking about longevity, they're not treating patients and they're also not using human models. No. And most of them are saying erroneous things Correct. and misguiding people on what's important. Awful. You got to look at the pyramid. What's the foundation of longevity? It is muscle. <laughs> you hear this guy? You hear this guy, Matthew? <laughs> yes, it is. And uh, we are going to move in that direction. And it's people are always looking at yeah, this idea of fasting more and restricting your protein. You don't want your IGF-1 to be high. You guys, they are totally missing the mark. And what's going to happen is we are going to have a weaker society with more, more hip replacements, more osteoporosis, more diseases that could have been prevented Yeah, because of the information. They are confusing people on the order of importance. And that is well really said, my friend. frustrating. Well said. How do you really feel about that? <laughs> yeah. No. And, 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 you know, there's, and some, and and we're talking about like the biggest, some of the biggest podcasts in the world who have huge platforms and they're sending misinformation. And it's really, it's really disheartening to see because people are trying to educate themselves on health and then they're, they end up, actually getting the wrong information. Correct. And so it's it's on the onus of the person who has this huge platform to make sure they're doing the right research and bringing on the right guests. And, and clinicians are a big part of that. And obviously- Huge part of that. That's why follow statin, if, for me, more than anything, it's it's just a tool to you to put on more muscle and lose less muscle as you age. It's very anti-catabolic. So that catabolism increases as you age. And we know one of the biggest drivers of sarcopenia is oxidative stress and chronic inflammation as well. And that mitochondrial dysfunction is what also leads to increase of muscle loss. Like we see that in FSHD, like muscular dystrophies. And we know with sarcopenia as well, that's that's part of the underlying mechanistic pathways. So if we can improve the mitochondrial health and that inflammatory cascade via phallostatin, and and not, so that's the mechanistic stuff. Mm -hmm. And then clinically, we also see people getting stronger. And we did DEXA scans, and you see people putting on muscle. Then how? Like to me, that stuff is going to be so much. It's going to trump everything else. Mm -hmm. We got to add D three creatine to that. I'll talk to you about that later. It's <laughs> in a, a way to directly measure skeletal muscle mass. Have um, any thoughts about, or have there been any studies on cachexia and uh, folostatin therapy, we, gene therapy? Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. As you know, First Form makes a ton of amazing products. I want to highlight their energy drinks. First Form Energy is phenomenal. They have all different types of flavors that you can't even believe how good they are. And I will tell you, one of my favorites is Tropic Lightning. I am a coffee person and I am a coffee person in the morning but I tend not to do a second cup in the afternoon. I have been using First Form Energy, and I'm going to tell you why. It has B6, B12, choline, things for my brain. Again, this is all about brain function for me and energy. Not only that, it has 100 milligrams of whole coffee fruit extract. It's called Neurofactor. Sign me up. You guys are absolutely going to love this product. It is one of my favorite energy drinks. And yes, I love a good energy drink. Go to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. I would suggest that you start with their variety six pack. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. We are going to be doing, so our phase two trial. That would be fascinating. So our phase two trial is going to be for sarcopenia. Uh, that's starting in the spring. And that's going to be, it's approved by Health Canada. So hopefully that'll be starting in May or but so. But before you do that, we really have to get something called a D3 creatine we, dilution method on there because DEXA, they, the changes in the sarcopenic individual um, can be so slight because the just, um, again, older and this way, if we do a D3 creatine, I've already inserted myself into the study, you'll be able to directly measure skeletal muscle mass because of that. So we'll talk about that. Oh, cool. It would You're be... hired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I'm not taking any new work, but yeah. uh, I will definitely contribute. No, because, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's Because you'll know. actually, that's that's now... Well, we were through. thinking about what I was, this was my, and my proposal was to actually do a uh, full body MRI using um, Springbok. I don't know if you heard of that company. Mm -hmm. They look at muscle kind of mass throughout the body and they look at myosteatosis. And so then you can Which see... Which is fat infiltration. Yes. And so... Getting a marbled steak. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what we were going to 
do. But that's obviously costly and pretty. Uh, that's why D3 creatine is, is yeah, going to be the way, yeah, that's so the way cool. of the future. So full statin gene therapy. Talk to me about um, how it is used. First of all, um, this has been around for how long? So statin because of bodybuilders, you know how bodybuilders are, the left experiment. They're on this actually stuff. early. Adopters yeah, of everything. They are. they are. And that's the fit. I, I, I made a post <laughs> about this one time. I Matthew's like, a bodybuilder. <laughs> But yeah, and that's because, you know, because I've been into the bodybuilding scene since I was 18. And I just love that world. And so I've seen they're always 10 years ahead of the medical world. It's kind of funny when it comes to advice related to lifestyle medicine. Correct. And so they understand because they've done so much self-experimenting, they've already figured out the patterns of what works and what doesn't work and make really actually reasonable recommendations for lifestyle interventions. And so follow statin uh, being self-experimenters as bodybuilders are, they've been playing around that for over 20 years. Injectable or injectable. orally? Because I yeah. think there is also an oral uh, an oral dose of uh, full of statin. Right. Which... And there probably is, but the bioavailability is of, terrible. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. most, most of them doesn't work very well. And so the problem, though, is that people didn't really see great results because the false statin has a 90 minute half life. So basically, you'd have to inject yourself every 90 minutes every day for months or two years to have the same effect as our gene therapy does, which why why is it because so you wouldn't inject full statin or take full statin and then that has now inhibited myostatin so it's because it gets it gets it's, it gets uh cleared up by and there's enzymes that break it down and so the expression of that lasts so only is so transient so what i'm hearing you say is that the folostatin gene therapy in order for it to be effective it has to be long lasting exactly and so that's what our delivery mechanism does, it essentially gets your cell to produce the folostatin and increase the circulatory levels for 18 to 24 months with one injection, either subcutaneously or intramuscularly. And that's- Is one more effective than the other? We are seeing anecdotally that intramuscular seems to be more effective. Does it matter where you put it? No. And so what we're going to do for a phase two trial is we're going to compare subcutaneous to intramuscular, and then we're going to see if one does do better than the other. Do you uh, feel that one does better than the other that you have seen? Yes. Intramuscular does seem to work better. And what does, when you say seem to work better, what are the outcomes? People tend to put on more muscle and have more strength gain. So let's say, generally speaking, people will get like 10 to 15% with subcutaneous, and the intramuscular maybe like 20 to 25% strength gains. And that's a lot. Our for friend someone. John definitely did it intramuscular. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> he did? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, and and that, and uh, you know, for someone who's been lifting for a lifetime, that's a lot of strength gain, and especially if you're natural, like that is not easy to come by, and that can that can translate into more volume, and that can translate into more hypertrophy, right? And then not only that, the recovery because of the less inflammation tends to be better too. And if you can recover better, then obviously you can do that progressive overload better too. And does uh, folostatin only target myostatin? It it's highly tissue specific. So it only targets skeletal muscle. So it's not going to affect like cardiac muscle or anything like that. And that's why the specific one we use is folostatin 344, which cleaves to 314 into the cell. And that specific folostatin is one that only acts on skeletal muscle. And so that's one of the things people often get worried about is like, oh, how do you know it's not affecting other things? It's because it's obviously it's been studied and we know <laughs> uh, how it works mechanistically. Who would and how would something like that be available? So the bodybuilding community has been using it for a long. This is interesting. They've been using it yeah, for a long Yeah, because people are like, oh, can I just get it off a website? And it's... Uh, uh, you can. <laughs> yeah. But... But... I don't not, know. I, I don't know. I think Matt was trying to get it off Amazon. I'm in the back over there. Um, so it it is available. It is one of those things that people could get out. You would never want to do that, right? The problem is, yeah, you don't know the quality control and all, all, all that stuff. And so obviously we're, we have our gene therapy vector, which is available in approved jurisdictions like Mexico. Uh, we have our headquarters is in Ruatan, funny enough, in Honduras. Uh, and then we also are doing it in Dubai and then in Japan as well in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And so we have areas where we have approvals and where it's regulated, but it is not FDA approved as of yet. Uh, that will probably take maybe five years at least, I would think. Uh, you know, they're, they are becoming more, I'd say they're, it, it's weird. The FDA says they want to do cell and gene therapy and they have this whole framework now where they're saying we really want to push these things forward, but then nothing's really been done. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's obviously uh, lobbyists and people who don't want to see that stuff go through uh, because it does disrupt the traditional model of, you know, big pharma and surgery and all that stuff, that infrastructure that they built in because cell and gene therapies are decentralizing care and can help prevent and mm -hmm. avoid surgeries, obviously. 
Yeah, I, you know, I'm just looking at this paper. Maybe I'll include it, but it is folostatin gene therapy improves six minute walk distance in sporadic inclusion body myositis. Do you remember that from med school? Yeah, body yeah, myositis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> and these are just these inclusion bodies that can cause uh, muscle and body inflammation. But this is done in humans and a six minute walk distance is what we use in geriatrics and what individuals will use as a marker of as a, a physical marker for I don't know the better word to say it, robustness, but there's a handful of tests that are validated in terms of improvements in um, life and longevity. And six minute walk test is one of those. Exactly. And that's and that's the other thing. So what we're going to measure in our phase two, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts if you have any other, I wanted to measure uh, grip strength because it's so easy. Uh, it's so, it's so I, easy. Okay, we but, can talk about this grip strength. <laughs> Everybody talks about this. It's, it's the thing. But I think that you're born with a certain kind of grip strength. I don't know. I will have to go back. I, I had been talking to Samuel Buckner um, maybe a year ago about it. And you and I are going to have to do some digging. Exchange. <laughs> yes, because I, I think, again, when we we accept things over and over again as the standard, just like we've accepted DEXA as the gold standard. And then we go back and we question it. Well, is it really the gold standard? No, DEXA is extrapolation. It looks at body fat. It looks at bone. Everything else is lean body mass. That's not measuring skeletal muscle mass directly. <clears throat> it makes me think that some of these metrics that we are potentially using could be off. So we're gonna have to. Uh, we'll we'll see. Trust me, I'd rather way rather measure like one rep squat, but that's not <laughs> practical necessarily. But fair, <laughs> fair. Um, so this folostatin gene therapy, who is it for? I, I'm sure you're gonna say for everybody. Are there any contraindications? How would one go about it? The only contraindication is pregnancy. And funny enough, when you're pregnant, your falstatin levels are the highest. <laughs> really? Yeah. And so we believe that is because falstatin acts as a protective mechanism for the body when you're, you, you know, some, I mean, obviously there's variable reports. Every pregnant woman would definitely disagree. Yeah, exactly. Post no. baby, <laughs> like what has happened? No, post baby, but during pregnancy, your falstatin levels actually peak. And I think that's obviously just as a protective mechanism to try to get your body to be as strong and resilient as possible during that phase. I, and, uh, so that's the only contraindication, but to your point, any adult who wants to slow down the aging process, wants to have more vitality, energy, strength, it can pretty, pretty much be applicable to everyone. And this, again, this isn't just me saying it. There's uh, George Church, who's arguably the best uh, or one of the best geneticists in, on the planet. Uh, he he said himself that he would like to see this in every like Walmart one day, like and accessible to everyone because it's such a inert vector that doesn't have any side effects and has the potential to really help so many people to put on. It's, it's the closest thing we have to exercise in a pill. Like obviously we're never going to exercise in a syringe, right? And so the reality is too, a lot of people have a hard time sticking to exercise because they may not get see the benefits. And if you do see more benefits, I think it's going to help with that positive feedback loop as well. If you see more muscle gain, if you see more strength gain, because some people do have bad genetics and it's hard for them to get that. And so I've had patients who wanted to do it just for that reason. They're like, I've always had a hard time putting on muscle. Because I was going to ask you, the, just from the physician side, what are the, you'd mentioned more vitality, more energy. My question would be, what are the objective measures that we would be able to measure with folostatin gene therapy? Yeah, so you could actually, I mean, aside from like the... Um, uh, you can look at like, for example, epigenetic clocks. Uh, so there's biological aging testing that you can do. There's and these are would these be telomeres? Is this they, they look at a whole so like, all the different hallmarks. So telomeres is part of it, mm -hmm. but then they also look at like inflammation, mitochondria, uh, immune dysfunction, and uh, different kind of the hallmarks of aging. And so true age diagnostic was the one we used for our phase one trial. Mm -hmm. uh, but for phase two, we might use a company called Generation Lab because they're using something called biological noise, which is a different type of measure of looking at how essentially entropy or how your body is aging ep epigenetically and looking at methylation from that perspective. And so, but the point is, these can give you objective measures to see how much we can de-age your body before and after the fall of statin. And we see quite significant reductions in epigenetic age when you do these interventions. If you're over 60, for example, the average age reduction was about 11 years with one intervention. And funny enough, XPRIZE, which is this prize given 
by it's it's by Peter Demandis and um, Chip Wilson, who has muscular dystrophy. They're giving away a hundred million dollars to anyone who can reduce biological age by ten years in three or more organ systems. And so we're going to be applying for that. And so You're that's like, we've got one organ system. <laughs> yeah, down. yeah, muscle. Uh, but we what we're going to measure multiple. Or, we we believe we can do it in multiple organ systems. Um, but obviously, muscle I think translates when you can do it in muscle. It translates into because it's all intertwined. And I think muscle is a foundation. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Now we're going to do a um, my favorite part of the episode. We're going to do yes or no. So basically think about this as within clinical practice, it is going to be yes or no. You can't you don't get to say anything else. The use of collagen orally. Yes. OK. <laughs> the use of PRP in a pregnant woman. No. The, uh, we'll say this, um, what's the other one? Sleep less than five hours. <laughs> no, unless you're a super sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> unless that you are a, a, a super sleeper. Knee replacement. You don't get to an answer any more than that. No. <laughs> Hip replacement. Yes. Fair. Okay, we're going to stop there. I love that answer. And I am going to guess why you said that. You are going to say that knee replacement is a no because out of all of the joints, knees seem to respond really well. Is that true? You mean to stem cells? To Am I allowed to say stem cells? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to treatment. To yes, treatment, yes. That, the, yes. that is one... It seems as if, and even in the traditional literature, that you, if you have knee arthritis or some kind of knee injury, that there is tremendous benefit yeah. to doing regenerative care. There is. But hips seem to be a little bit more hit or miss. Yeah. And that probably could be because there's more mechanical component to it. And that mechanical component needs a mechanical fix. And hence why you need some sort of structural uh, replacement. But having said that, we're, we're very close to having that mechanical fix because we are getting something called hydrogel scaffolds now. We just got, we just, mm. we just started our investigation with that now. So these are polymers, which are hyaluronic acid based, but they 3D crosslink. So it essentially forms like a little jello like scaffold around the stem cells, and then it can actually regrow new cartilage. And so that cartilage engineering approach is what I think you need for something like hips, as opposed to knees, which t tend to do well, which is that kind of inflammatory uh, reduction. That's really, I think, very helpful to bring this back. We we've been talking about a lot of different things, and to bring this back to a practical application, as we're both clinicians, is this idea of the umbrella of regenerative medicine. And regenerative medicine is really about, no shock, regeneration. Regeneration of cartilage. Would you say that that is something that can happen? We're really close to it, okay. and it's already happening in clinical trials. And now we're with the hydrogels, and then with three D bioprinting, it's mm -hmm. going to be there in the next few years. What about muscle tears? Yes, that that like we can do right. hand over like easy <laughs> muscle tears. What about tendon injury? Yeah, I, I, like pretty much close, like hundred percent success rate with the right treatments yeah without surgery yeah uh what else am i missing so if it's a tendon rupture that then you need surgery. surgery yes but then we're talking most patients aren't ruptures right most are chronic degenerative tearing and those are not actually great outcomes with surgery they're te they're very poor outcomes with surgery. So we need better alternatives. So why not explore this stuff anyway for the mainstream doctor to look at too? And I think that's where there's a lot of I think it's just I think it's just territorial. Like orthopedic surgeons don't want to give up their because this is their bread and butter, right? It's surgery. And also it's what they know. They are a trained surgeon. And yeah. if you are it's like if you are trained to cut, then you cut. Yeah, yes, exactly. What about shoulders? So yeah, no, shoulders do very well with even osteoarthritis and with uh, rotator cuff tears, which is the most common thing we see by far. But often they need that scaffolding because a lot of them have focal full thickness tears or they have high grade tears. And so that's where you have to use a scaffold and, that's, and then the cells and the signals to kind of regenerate the tissue. Mm. Well, I have to say, um, Dr. Khan, we could go on and on to discuss this. Really, it's so informative. It's so informative and, and really what you're talking about is an ultimate root cause approach to being able to maintain a quality of life that is where it should be. 
yeah, we're going to make your body forever strong with <laughs> Sal and gene therapy. <laughs> Incredible. I'm going to steal that line. <laughs> steal that. Fair enough. Um, we're going to link where everyone can find you. You know, we didn't really touch on nutrition. I'm guessing you and I have very similar nutritional views. My big thing, and I'll just throw this in there, is making this light, like, you know, I think Peter was the one who came up with Medicine 3.0. And so there's this concept, right, of Medicine 1.0, 2.0. Medicine 1.0 is obviously like the Stone Ages. And then Medicine 2.0 was kind of just surgery and drugs for everything. 3.0 was to try to prevent issues, right, using lifestyle. And then to me, Medicine 4.0 is using cell and gene therapies to allow people to maintain lifestyle longer. But Medicine 3.0, we have to make more accessible. Like most people know that they need to exercise and eat well. And the mechanics of that is really starting to, for a lot of people to understand it, but they don't know how to actually maintain it. And so I think the biggest problem is how do we actually create, sustain behavior change and make it more accessible to the average person? Yeah, it's a, that is a very large task. Yes. That is a very large <laughs> task. But if we put the pieces in place from the physical aspect and you put the pieces in place from a mental aspect, I am a strong believer that a strong body cannot exist with a weak mind. Yes. A strong body cannot exist with a weak mind. And wherever you are starting on your journey, there is a certain amount of mental strength that will re be required of you to push through some of these things. And I, I just have to say that at the end of the day, when you know I was kind of talking to Matthew before we started, that you have to do the practical things or the practical things become impossible. Right. You must do the practical things like train, like eat right, like whatever it is that you want to do in order to be able to do the practical things later on. Yeah. And the whole idea of these cell and gene therapy interventions is to build the resiliency so you can do those practical things. I love it. Well, Dr. Khan, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's really fun. Where and what are you up to next? I'm going to link everything so people can find you. <laughs> uh, yeah, my Instagram is at dr.acon, but I'm going to be most likely in Dubai in the fall. I'm still here on this side of the world, and we're going to have other physicians that we're training, and we're going to have hopefully create more access to these therapies for people who are suffering with a lot of chronic illnesses that fall through the gaps. And so you can either find me in Cabo or in Dubai. <laughs> On the beach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me.